one that's rather informally and does not have a prepared text as such. As a way of introduction, I would just like to tell you that uh, he was born in Germany and came to the United States in 1949, has taught at several universities, including MIT and Penn State. Uh, is that right? University of Pennsylvania, sorry. And his current works uh, presently in Louisville and is co author of a book with Brady Clay's roommate. Help, 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 help. Uh, he's agreed to join us for this year. Right now. And he'll be working well, in the Arts and Landscape Studio on a year long project, visiting us two or three times a year. And we invite all of you to stop in and see what we're doing and to meet him whenever he's in town. That's it. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I had a very fascinating trip this morning. Um, the
Um, when I finally made the decision to practice landscape architecture, um, I had to give up my contracting firm. The first few years in this country, just like Japanese designers and gardeners practice, you not only design your landscapes, but you also execute them. And I did pride myself being a good waiter. I really know how to handle the rake and I enjoy soil thoroughly. When I look at this floor here, you know, the floor that you're all sitting on and standing on, it reminded me of uh, the story that a very famous Japanese landscape designer told me on party who was involved in the design of the Japanese house that is now Philadelphia. Um, and I became familiar with him because I was a landscape architect for the Motel on the Mountain in Southern New York, working very closely with the Japanese architect Yandu Yashimura. Um, this very famous landscape architect, designer, uh, Jewish interpreter, said goodbye to me. They somehow communicated non verbally. And he gave me his hands, and in his hand was a little stone. And in parting, he said, Never forget to caress the stone. And when I look at the floor, I wish that all of us could take our shoes off to really appreciate the texture that in this wood. But if we run around with our hard soles, you know we might as well walk almost any other surface. There's a great deal of richness, you know, in an environment which eludes us if we don't really make contact with it. Um, so what very much bothered me that I had to give up my immediate contact with soil once I made a decision to just practice landscape architecture. That my only contact with soil was via a sharp pencil point. In fact, I started to sculpt those days to make up for this loss of uh, sensory contact. Now, a few things happened since. Um, Having worked very closely with Ian the car, I know that Ian took landscape architecture and so Lewis and so on into the direction of the larger region. Landscape architecture in the early 60s then expanded and developed a scientific basis for its whole operation, namely that for the first time we were able to then try to understand and work with the determinants of natural systems. And so you saw this direction of landscape architecture expand into the larger region, as you heard about it today. And this is really pretty much the way landscape architecture is practiced today. Uh, I worked very well this year because not only am I a landscape architect, but also a psychologist. So instead of only asking ourselves the question to design with nature and what that implies, and how deeply and how complex the sciences are now that you have to become familiar with. I also ask myself, as I took landscape architecture into the opposite direction, the question planning with human nature. And once you ask that, you at least have to put a question mark behind such a statement. And since ultimately we're designing environments for people, we really have to go deeply in our attempt to understand how we take ourselves how people do grow up, how people relate themselves to each other, what social structures are, what different lifestyles are, because even the employment of and the understanding of natural systems takes place in the context of creating a viable environment for human habitation. So on one hand, landscape architecture very much went into the realm of physical ecology. And on the other hand, it went very much into the realm of a human ecology. So it was not accidental why I became interested in neighborhoods. When I first started to teach at Penn, I took my students into the core areas of the city. Because as we saw today in our film, in the slideshow, in the suburbs, uh, it's very hard for you to get a sense of human habitation because you primarily see cars and very few people. But once you are in the midst of the city, and especially during the warm summer months, life seems to be spilling over into the sidewalks, into the streets, and you get a real sense as to how masses of people coexist, how effective or ineffective environments are. I became also interested in the question, what in fact is a norm? And we're talking a great deal about mental health. 
And if you ask any psychiatrist to tell you what his sense of norms for health are, they get very bewildered. The mental health profession really deals more with mental sickness than with health. But as a planner or as an landscape architect, if you want to somehow design for vibrant communities, these questions are really fundamental. Um, you know, um, at the same time, that in the city, you face a reality of coexistence of masses. The question is, and you all hear these words, alienation, that people alienate themselves from each other, there's the impact of crowding. The question came up, what can a landscape architect contribute to create more viable interrelationships between people? And what was, what is pretty standard today, um, became a tremendous challenge those days. Are there other clients that landscape architecture can give leadership to besides the clients that we were accustomed to serve that they do in the 50s, which were primarily private or corporate clients? How, in fact, does one work effectively with new kinds of clients, grassroots neighborhoods in the core areas of the city or grassroots neighborhoods in the suburbs? How does one work effectively with younger people, students, high school students, even uh, public school students, university and college students. And how does the landscape architect work effectively with the new client, namely the emerging institution of the volunteer? The tremendous number of human beings that American society generates that have three hours that they would like to spend not only on watching television and playing golf, as work days shorten, the incredible amount of human energies that right now have not been orchestrated. And what I'm currently doing in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, a project I'd just like to tell you about briefly. Uh, for about six, seven months, we are conducting a citywide educational program. The program is called Community Through Environment. And what we are doing during these last few months, analyzing and developing for discussion purposes a system for city-wide orchestration of existing resources so that people can act effectively on the environment without necessarily having to use much money. So what we are taking an inventory of mainly is voluntary energy. And there are many different levels of voluntary energy. There's a whole group of professional volunteers. I don't know whether you have such groups here in your own state, but um, in Louisville and in Lexington, Kentucky, you have community design centers, which are organizations that recruit professional volunteer designers to render service to communities. This is exactly the kind of organization that I succeeded to establish in Philadelphia in 1961 when my students first volunteered to work in communities and later on we needed to recruit professional volunteers to give continuity to professional service in neighborhoods. During the 60s, I organized about eight nonprofit corporations in different cities throughout the United States, recruiting interdisciplinary teams of professionals, architects, landscape architects, engineers, lawyers, artists, anthropologists, sociologists, all of whom worked in concert with one another to give guidance to self-help participation in environmental development. Now, in Washington, when I founded the Nickel Commons Corporation, we needed special permission of the AIA and ASLA so that professionals could volunteer without violating the ethical code. By now, the AIA sponsors such organizations. So you have a tremendous amount of dedicated, highly thoughtful, intelligent, experienced energies among professionals who are willing to give all their time and their creativity to the betterment of the lives of the co-citizens in the city and the environment. This is one group of volunteers. So I already have met with various groups. For instance, not only did I meet with these people, but I found this in Louisville, Kentucky, the leaders of each of these specific components. We met, for instance, this Jasper Ward, you might know his name, who was host to about 60 architects. 
who do this cast to present an opportunity for professional leadership to the self-help movement. A meeting at the end of this month with artists to see what impact can artists contribute as to community leadership to work uh, for citizen participation in environmental development. And we have about 20 groups organized. Not only do volunteers come from, from uh, professional circles, but volunteers also come from scouts, from uh, fraternities, from all kinds of youth organizations. And we are suggesting in Louisville to explore possibility for the establishment of a citywide environmental youth core. There was a certain precedent in this country that Americans faced existential hardship during the Depression. The survival instinct of Americans during those days generated national creativity and the Youth Conservation Corps was established, the Civilian Conservation Corps was established. I know how many people still pointed, pointed out to me in the last few decades how effective the design work was that the Civilian Conservation Corps performed in many parks. Many structures and parks that you see around were designed and executed through these voluntary, highly dedicated participations. Um, the question is, even the army, the military approached me recently. The instruction given to the different branches of the military, isn't there a possibility for the military to channel its energies, as public relations isn't the best right now, but they're not very busy, isn't it possible for the army to contribute to community development? The question is, what can then landscape architects and architects and environmentalists really do in giving leadership to these energies that if you don't transform them into constructive work, you know, uh, are really waste to society? And we're finding ourselves in a really incredible situation. On one hand, we know now that you can't expect much money from Washington. It doesn't mean that if one doesn't get one's heads together, that money will not come about ultimately and that one shouldn't request and put pressure on it. But what does one do right now? There was a whole decade where people were promised new frontiers, great society, and nothing is coming forward. And what this does to people's morale, you can easily imagine yourself. So we are really facing crisis. We're facing other kinds of crisis. Look at our cities right now. City after city after city. We know we see nothing in evidence but urban blight, destruction, deterioration, pollution. How long do you feel can we continue to afford the growing credibility gap? Not to speak of what foreign visitors will, you know, take back with them as an impression as to how the cities of the nation look like, in fact, that is supposed to be give democratic leadership to the world. What, in fact, can we do in this state of emergency to harness and to orchestrate existing resources? And I mean this now in a very specific technological way, just like any construction, uh, you know, a builder would orchestrate and synchronize his own resource. There are a few new ingredients that are necessary. When people work for money, they're being paid. When people do not work for money, they need other rewards but money. In fact, people do volunteer only if, in fact, the act of volunteerism can provide for them much more spiritual satisfaction. So we have once in one meeting in Louisville that will be hosted by John Jory, who is the impresario and the director of the Actors Theatre. They try to get together quite a few people in that meeting who in fact can stage building events as celebrations of community. Now if I take you back to an old American tradition that was most inspiring to me, it's the tradition of barn raising. When the old American farmer Farmers worked with each other and in order to survive erected their barns in common. In this act of working with one another, in concert with each other, because the farmers were functionally dependent on each other for survival, they also developed a sense of community. Now I'm suggesting that today there is a possibility for us 
to contribute as landscape architect, as environmentalist, to the development of community in this country. We can ill afford to develop community by generating a common energy. How can we portray a common vision so that people can be inspired by a vision that we can portray in terms of a heightened quality of life or a heightened quality in environment that will allow people then to orchestrate their energy together and work in concert with one another. I don't know if I get around to show you slides, but if you know the work of Gaudi, don't you? Antonio Gaudi especially went to Spain to see these marvelous benches that were covered with mosaic. Colorful mosaics, fragments of mosaic that don't cost anything. When you go to New York City right now, this very day, in Manhattan, at Grand Stone, the National Park Service, together with the Office of Cultural Affairs of New York City, the private foundation and in industry put up some money so that an artist, a sculptor, was able to hire four other artists. And they designed and built beautiful benches around Grand Stone. And hundreds of people from all walks of life, little children, grown-ups, people come from churches, from settlements, houses from neighborhood organizations, all work together, putting these mosaic tiles on these undulating benches and arches that are being built around Grand Stone. This, to me, is only one example of that which is possible. Now, I'm suggesting something else. I'm suggesting that times have changed, where professionalism is professionalism only if we really take initiative and somehow contribute to society in a way that we feel we can really contribute profoundly. I also feel that we have to assume responsibility for operation and administration of the innovative enterprise. I'm yet surprised why the profession of landscape architecture that has so much difficulty being accepted by the public at large and how much we want to spread the world of landscape architecture around and how deeply we feel that it's not only an ego trip on our part but how deeply we feel uh, that we want to communicate our jitters about ten years, the ten years ecological balances to the public at large. How much we as professions are so much aware of the imminent ecological crisis that faces us all. I know that just two years ago, I was on a panel in, invited by the Florida chapter of landscape architecture. In Florida, people are really worried that 10 years from now, there will be water crisis, shortage. But unless ways of life are changed, and people will no longer just have two or three cars and sprinkle as much water around as they do right now. In fact, Florida will be in bad shape. Now, these are predictions that we as landscape architects are really working with. How can, how can we be the most effectively together and not say on this campus anywhere to work with each other, assume operational responsibility for place and invite the public at large to that facility? I told students this morning, it's quite a difference to specify geraniums for some project, and it's a different story for somebody to water them. If we as professionals don't know and don't deeply understand what it means to water a plant, a great part of our professionalism has not been reenacted or has not become part of our consultation. Do you follow me? How important it is to grow organically and professional competence, that we are really starting to demonstrate, to innovate, and that's what universities in fact are to me, and professional organizations. Both universities and professional organizations are also structures for innovations. Both of them are the research and design component of society. Now what I want to suggest to you that we've explored during the ensuing months, both the students, faculty, and practitioners. As landscape architecture develops very strongly in one direction of regional planning, as our work, as our work becomes more and more abstract, because we have less we have less and less immediate contact with the elements in our environment. And this contribution is highly significant and very important. And it's very important to feed all these complex data into computer systems. But in order for landscape architecture to grow wholesomely, we have to balance its system to also think of quality, 
of qualitative development that takes place on this other area of intimacy. When we focus on the neighborhood, we can then really come in contact with life as it is really is. You don't understand living if you just hover over an area in a helicopter and understand the larger region. Unless you smell and touch and are present of the living, you don't really deeply understand how children live with themselves, how they play, how they interact with grown-ups, how grown-ups get along with that, how the impact on the environment is really experienced, how you can observe a first hand. Life itself can serve you as the only laboratory to understand the living. So we have to also then develop qualitatively. And that's why I refer to this flow. And what this mouth meant to me this morning, I still remember, I'm repeating myself a little bit from this morning, that at one point, because I was so involved in liking really soil and smelling and feeling and touching it, that I developed really skill in grading. I knew what sandy soils could do and kind of to clay soil. Sometimes I tried to work with soil stabilizers to work young the hand, hand angle of repose. And when I looked at this mound this morning, I wondered how was it possible and what was the significance of how many people had to contribute to build this fantastic mound with whatever primitive technology existed those days. I know that uh, Naguchi at one point, as a sculptor, was asked to do something imaginative with thousands of tons of um, that was pushed around by highway construction. Society didn't engage a landscape architect asking landscape architects to do something imaginative with soil because they are not learning that way. They have no way of experimenting you know, with what soil can really do as a plastic material. I know that now landscape architects got away a little bit from land scraping. If you see you know, a landscape that kind of pile up soil and in all kind of undulating forms. So I'm suggesting, this in fact was my suggestion to Penn, to Penn, to Penn um, um, 14 years ago, that landscape architecture, to study landscape architecture profoundly, we not only need computers, we also need workshops for experimentation. Even handling plants, if you don't know how to face a plant and don't really do it, you'll never learn it. You don't really understand the subtleties. You never develop the intricacy of skills that the Japanese develop as you know how to put flagstones and stepping stones about. You have to also somehow learn through your tactile intelligence, through your rhythmic intelligence, not only through your powers of conceptualization. The significance of this work, if you have time, I would like to show you in uh, some slides, okay? Um, um, let's start with the first. Let's try to skip the second. Um, there's another significant aspect that happens with ar landscape architects. But I referred earlier to the emergence of social structures in our large metropolitan area. We really face only two alternatives. Can I? No, this, this is the second one. Can you get me the other one? Okay. So I Because it had happened in the late 70s, 
not to the initiative of a landscape architect, but to the initiative of Monsignor Robert Fox, who was a coordinator of the Spanish Action Program for the Archdiocese in New York City. On one day, in 46 separate blocks, 50,000 people acted in concert with one another, developing open spaces and developing architectural spaces. 50,000 people and 5,000 volunteers from the suburbs. In each block worked autonomously. Let me just go through it quickly. Now, without all these energies, this basement could have never been cleaned up as they were here in a half a day's work. It wasn't just beautification, men work, women work, teenagers work, repairing buildings after they were burnt out, setting up workshops in streets, and converting some of these real messy basements into community facilities. This was all done by volunteers, it was all done by building material and tools, it was backboard, and took a great deal of time. What I'm exploring in Louisville right now is, since we talked about the volunteers, where does building material come from? I'm going to have a meeting in a few weeks from now with presidents of local industry. What, in fact, can local industry do to consolidate all its waste or recyclable material and put it at the disposal of city government? I'm also going to have a meeting with the historic, with the historic conservation people because it's important not only to preserve historic buildings but also historic building materials. So we are very systematically taking inventory of what in fact is really possible if people go together in a city-wide system. One other meeting that we are going to have is on the mass greening of Louisville. Now you might have heard that China recently is about a mass greening of its country. Recently an article appeared that all of Vienna joined together to get involved over a weekend in a mass tree planting planting of Vienna. Having been in Palestine, lived there for 12 years, I know that planting trees in the desert and in rocky mountains was just not an ordinary act of tree planting. But thousands and thousands of trees were planted by volunteers in Israel as, so, as a survival strategy. My question is, isn't it possible to professional leadership that landscape architects and other environmentalists can render to really get off the ground, meet the challenges of the day, and organize mass environmental action as mass celebrations of community. Well, when 50,000 people work together, cleaning up 46 blocks, this then you might say um, gives us a sense as to what you can do in 10 days working on 40, 460 blocks. And for, to ritualize the voluntary building day, you need food, you also need music. So what I'm really trying to explore, how can we develop a system for mass participation of citizens in environmental development? One facility we're going to build or develop in Louisville is a workshop for experimentation, where all the volunteers can come and see what can be done with recyclable material. I want to then go back and uh, explore some alternatives. This is a playground in New York City. The only thing you can say about it is vandal proof. But is it a playground? This is also a playground in Washington. Now here, the playground that doesn't cost much money. You know the adventure playgrounds in England and in Scandinavian countries, which are already established. And something else is happening. The first businessman I got some money from to set up the first nonprofit corporation happens to be right now the governor of the state of Pennsylvania. And through his sponsorship, one of my colleagues works statewide in Pennsylvania using recyclable material, building playgrounds for free. And industry can benefit from tax write-offs. These things are happening. Uh, another, since the student this morning had this is another approach to architecture. A friend of mine in Cambridge, Neil Mitchell, deliberately developed a structural system made of lightweight concrete. And it's a strange picture. Imagine that. Two people carry a beam of concrete that can span a whole house. It was deliberately designed so that people can build houses for themselves, 
who do not have much money for machinery, but have a lot of muscle grease to put to work. This was another architectural attempt to create a structure of housing that people can build for themselves. It's a, it came from Mongolia in its yurt construction. It took two days and four people to put the structure up. It houses comfortably 20 people to sit around for $500, and it's very easy to assemble. In fact, there's a whole group of 20 young people who go from community to community around New England, teaching people to build yurts. This is some, some house that people converted to a little casino. Uh, to come back to the mountains, I spent a summer with Paolo Soleri before he got into his oncology. Paolo Soleri, in fact, takes silt and scratches into the silt. Sometimes he just makes big, big mounds of soil or silt and then pours concrete on it. And here he takes wax paper and pours the concrete on top of it. And what you see, wherever the concrete came in touch with the silt, it absorbs it into its texture. And wherever the concrete came in touch with the wax paper, it stays white. This is a piece of architecture that to me is of heightened quality. Not 1% of art attached to the building after it has been finished. These are some of the intricate forms of architecture that Paulo Silveri's building create because they're produced through specific technology that also harness a lot of people into construction. So I like to call it the development of a labor-intensive environmental craft technology. Do you follow me? It's not like going back to the guild system, but it's developing a technology that doesn't displace labor, but that creates products that require more human hand for the implementation. The machine only takes away the back-breaking work. The kind of architecture that we create right now is impersonal because our, te our technology produces only much of a unit that are devoid of the human touch. And therefore, these environments are very alienating. Let me show you some of the roofs of Gaudi's building. Roofs don't have to be only flat. Old crockery. And here are the wax towers that I mentioned to you before. This man was an illiterate Italian tile setter who came to this country as an immigrant and wanted to do something important for America. And since he lived next to a dam, on the evening hours, he would go to the dam and help himself to whatever he could find there, bed springs, old steel. And as an Italian tile setter, he created this environment, this bottlenecks, this marble chips, and then the fragments of tile. an incredible intricate construction. He's known now to be one of the great artists of our 20th century. He, in fact, intuited the construction that is used for space missiles. And when you see the fantastic work that he did do in one year, I'm always asking myself, what can we do, since he spent 30 years in building it, what can 30 of us or 300 of us do if you work together? And it's absolutely amazing if you look through the guest book. There are about 20,000 visitors that come there annually. And the entries into the guest book of every person speaks the same language. Tremendous. Keeps the face big. God is still with us. The tangible and symbolic expression of this man's perseverance, courage, dedication speak a powerful language. And if you somehow get all your energies together, you know, to get a tangible and symbolic expression of your common will, with your inspired yearnings and desires, you can create places and environments which can become meccas to many, just like the Watts Towers has become a mecca to me. This was also done 30 years by an artist in Woodstock, New York, I'd like to um, show you another ritual in Spain that is 
the poor people once a year get together to celebrate a religious holiday. And since flowers are part of people's lives in Spain, they're not very expensive. And for two weeks, people sit together cutting petals of carnations. And as they cut petals of carnations, somebody brings a bottle of wine and somebody brings a guitar. And community happens because it happens. And then different groups of families and teenagers work out different patterns. And people then create flower carpets. And if I had a motion camera with me, you would have seen these beautiful paintings emerge right in front of your eyes. And these are flower petals and seed parts that are put there one day because during that afternoon a procession walks over these sidewalks and over these narrow streets. And can you imagine what happens as year after year the procession walks over these flower carpets? Sooner or later these flower carpets become permanently embedded in the sidewalk and transform miraculously into mosaic. And here it all starts, you know, this is a desire to express. If we take this expression seriously, then all of us and in the people that we come in contact with, as a way of life, if we, if we as designers don't usurp the creative initiative of others, but if you learn to create the kind of environment that would inspire people to leave their influence on their surroundings, then we'll also end up with things like that. Thank you.